Good morning, students. It's a beautiful day to learn more about writing rhetorical analysis. Now that you have received feedback on your essays, you should watch this video with your essays and rubric in hand and pay careful attention to make sure that you understand how to write this essay. You should have a notebook and paper to take notes. To get started, let's talk about what will be in this video. I go into this knowing that every rhetorical analysis essay will have directions that I should annotate and then 600 to 800 words that I should read carefully while taking notes. I have recorded myself taking this test in real time using my very fancy CAN and iPhone document camera. Those are diced tomatoes and black beans for those of you who will be desperately curious and need to know. So what's in this video? The same steps you should take when you write this essay for the exam with the addition of reviewing the rubric, which is what your graders will be doing when they score your exam. I'm going to read and annotate the prompt starting with the directions. I'm going to plan and organize the paper, perhaps in a little more detail than you might on the exam, so that you can see the process. I'm going to write this paper, that's great, I wrote this in real time, mistakes and all, so we can go through this process together. I'm going to review the rubric as I go through the paper that I wrote, so you can clearly understand how to earn points for thesis, evidence and commentary, and sophistication, or style. Reading and annotating. I underlined the time frame and the most significant general information about the author. I want to remember that all analysis essays require me to identify the argument and identify the strategies the author uses to make that argument, so I'm going to look for those things in the prompt and make sure that I see the specific questions the prompt asks me to answer. This prompt asks for an argument about colonial American society. When I read, I'm going to look for technique and purpose, or how and why. I know from the prompt that the purpose is to define what it means to be an American, so I am looking to answer the question, what, according to the author, does it mean to be an American, and how does he demonstrate that? I'm always going to start by looking closely at diction, because that's a strategy present in all writing. If I see better strategies than diction, I can always adjust later. I'll time lapse here, but notice that I have my own shorthand as I go through. I underline everything I think I might need, and sometimes I draw squiggly lines under or circle or box something I think might be essential. You could be more organized than I am and use underline for strategy and a box or squiggly for argument. I also take brief notes. I'm abbreviating things like rhetorical questions as RQ and American as AM. These notes only need to make sense to me when I'm planning, and since time is a consideration, they can be sloppy shorthand that only you can read. I'm marking positive and negative diction as I start to see that pattern, and I'm marking transitions between former lives and American lives as I start to see that the author talks about conditions of immigrants before they came here and after. I'm noting strategies that could be important, with the understanding that I won't pick which ones to use until I've read the entire passage. This reading and annotation should take you about 10 minutes, and planning should take you about 5. Notice that at this point, I start to transition into the planning stage. Planning. I'm going to list the strongest strategies and start to decide what I want to use. I'm also going to draft an idea for a thesis with the understanding that when I go to pick my evidence, that thesis might change. Remember that the rubric starts with a thesis and that five out of six points revolve around establishing and supporting a line of reason from that thesis, so it's worth it to take the time to make sure it's strong and clear. My initial thesis, and it will evolve as I write this, is as follows. In the passage, the author defines Americans as new, regenerated people able to thrive and succeed. Notice that I'm going to go back and check my prompt to make sure that I include everything I need. That will lead me to add a clause, uses rhetorical questions and diction to define, so that my thesis has an argument and strategies. It is still a little choppy, but I am doing this in real time, mistakes and all, because this is how you should do it timed. I've also made my peace with the fact that I might misspell that author name, and I'll check my prompt when I can, but if I switch an O and an E once or twice, I'm not going to lose points. If I call him by his first name, however, that could lead me away from a style point because it is informal. I'm also taking a few moments to show you some examples of what to avoid. The following is not a clear enough argument. He uses diction and rhetorical questions to make an argument about what it means to be an American. The problem here is that I don't take a position about what the author says it means. I could add qualifiers and say it's a great argument that he makes, but that still doesn't say what the argument is, so it still doesn't address the prompt. If I adjust it to say that he suggests it is great to be an American, that is taking a position, though it's a vague one. 
Now, if I clean it up to say that he suggests to be an American is to be reborn a better version of the European immigrant than before, that's a strong and specific argument. Look at your own paper now to see what you did here. More on planning and organization. You would do this during your planning and thesis writing, and you would not list as many quotes as I do here or take the time to write everything out in as much detail, but you would go through an abridged version of this process, which I will spend more time on here to show you how to think through this assignment. Let's start with some stick figures, because I know you all might miss the comforting mediocrity of my art on the chalkboard. This is Sue's student. She remembers that her English teacher says to take time to plan and check for an argument and strategies before writing. Be like Sue. Check your thesis. I'm going to write my argument out again, but you could look at what you've already written on your planning earlier and save the time. The author suggests that colonial Americans are better off here than they were before. I'm going to use rhetorical questions and diction as strategies. I advise you to plan on the same sheet of paper you used to take notes on the reading. Some of you got fancy in your selection of strategies and used hypophora, which is impressive because we did not review that one in class. That means the author asks and then answers a rhetorical question, usually answering extensively. I'm just going to stick to good old rhetorical questions and diction here because the fancy words are great, who doesn't love Zugma tossed into a paper, but you can also earn a six with the basics. I'm going to go back with a different color of pen because that helped me organize, but you could use stars or squiggles or some symbol you haven't used yet. What I'm doing here, marking directly on the prompt, is probably the most time efficient way to plan out quotes. I am also going to write them out myself, which could be a helpful step for you too, especially if you abbreviate. If time is a big issue here, don't worry about this extra step. Just watch this so you can see what I was thinking. Now is a good time to look at the planning you did. If you have a naked paper with nothing or very little on it or you did not actually write notes, consider doing this differently next time. If you're looking at a computer screen with the prompt, you definitely want to do what I'm doing here and write out the thesis strategies and actual quotes on a sheet of paper. Notice that a lot of what I'm planning revolves around the things that I made a note of during step one. So while I am planning, I am reading these specific quotes again and sorting using plus and minus signs. I'm going to list many quotes here and then do some note taking about how I might plan and organize and what the strongest quotes are. I'll also some suggest some ways that I could use the arrangement of quotes to transition using ideas while writing and strengthen my style, though in the writing step I'll actually end up doing things a little bit differently in this paper. It's fine to adjust as you go through the steps of this process. It's also fine to stick to what you have if you've definitely answered the prompt. After I sort my quotes, I'm going to jot down or think about a few different ways to organize and decide which one feels right. Then I'm going to organize how my quotes fit into my two paragraphs here before starting. Writing the essay. This is the longest part, but you shouldn't be spending 35 or 40 minutes on it. I timed myself at about 26. I'm going to start with one sentence, contextualizing the ideas in the thesis and funneling into my argument when I write. I'm not going to craft a beautiful, breathtaking introduction, though a few of you did, and bravo to that. I'm going to do here what I need to move toward a style point, which is to set myself up to situate my argument in a broader societal context. I won't spend too much time on it because I know that sophistication is one point, and writing a strong thesis and then defending a line of reasoning is five points. I'm fine-tuning my thesis statement as I write it out here, but as long as I have checked that I have an argument and strategies, I've earned one out of six possible points on this essay. Take a moment to look at the electronic rubric you received with your own essay and make sure you understand how to get this thesis point in the first few minutes of writing. This point also sets you up for success in the paper. The first paragraph is important, but remember that you can come back from it and redeem yourself if you make mistakes here. I check for all parts of the prompt before moving on. Author specific purpose and argument? Check. Techniques? Check. Before we go on to prove that thesis, let's take a moment to look at the rubric for evidence and commentary. I'm going to read the expectations for a four. It provides specific evidence to support all claims in a line of reasoning. So if I include the evidence that I have planned, I meet this part of the qualification. If you look at the rubric, 3 and 4 out of 4 include specific evidence, and 1 and 2 include mostly general evidence. Second, and notice the and, so you could meet the first part for evidence but not meet for commentary, 
commentary consistently explains how the evidence supports a line of reasoning and explains how multiple rhetorical choices contribute to an argument, purpose, or message. It should uniformly offer evidence to support claims, focus on the importance of words and details, specific words and details from the passage, and use multiple supporting claims, each with adequately clearly explained evidence. A three, by contrast, still has those specific examples and specific language, but it may focus on only one strategy or it may fail to integrate some evidence or fail to support a key claim. Sometimes this happens when a student doesn't have a clear thesis to begin with, finds one as they write, and then as a result doesn't have enough time left to fully develop support with multiple strategies working together. Please review the specific description of the points you earned in evidence and commentary to make sure you understand why. Now, I'm going to write the rest of this essay and show you one way to get a 4 out of 4 for evidence and commentary. Phew! That was a tough 26 minutes, and it makes sense that my hand is cramping, but once it's over, I'm done. Now, let's take a look paragraph by paragraph. Notice that the subthesis statement has technique and purpose, and that because I'm organizing by descriptions of life before Americans came here, and then life after, this paragraph will focus on the first half of my argument. If you organize by technique, your subthesis will be a little bit different and include your entire argument, but only one strategy. The line of reasoning here is that Americans suffered through life before they became Americans, and so far I have used specific word choice like poor and questions about how a wretch who is wandering around starving can call that country that inflicts such pain a home. Let's take a look at the rest of that paragraph. Notice that the line of reasoning is continued here and that I use one word quotes to talk about diction. Often I'm using a short quote and paraphrasing and then citing the specific lines. Near the end of this paragraph, I start to transition using ideas to wrap up this paragraph but make sure that I continue to prove the same line of reasoning. At this point in the essay, I have already used specific evidence and multiple strategies to prove a line of reasoning, so I'm on my way to at least a 3 out of 4. This is a benefit of organizing by content idea and not just by strategies, but you could just as easily get the same score with strategy paragraphs, as many of you did. Let's move on to the second paragraph, which focuses on life as an American. Notice that at the beginning, I fall a little short of where I might want to be referencing the argument in the subthesis. I have my strategies in there, but I don't get to what an American is until the next sentence. That's okay, but to improve, I could have planned that subthesis better, though this won't cost me any points as long as I get there eventually. At the end of this paragraph, I'm going to make sure to allude back to my thesis and reiterate that I'm proving my line of reasoning. I'm going to continue talking about both diction and rhetorical questions and carefully transitioning through ideas to show support of my line of reasoning throughout. This will take me to that four in evidence and commentary. Note that I'm doing some things to help get that sophistication point as well. I'm integrating a rhetorical question smoothly to avoid just dropping it in there, and I'm making small edits to word choice when appropriate, like formerly impotent people, because I know nuanced language will help me with style. Let's take a moment to look at that rubric about sophistication and style point, which we talked about setting up in the intro and in the body paragraph just now, and we will also consider in the conclusion. Remember that one element of this point is style used consistently and that it can't be just a phrase or a reference. Some ways we can earn this point according to the rubric are by demonstrating sophistication of thought and or complex understanding of rhetorical situation, explaining significance or relevance of rhetorical choices, explaining purpose or function of the passages, complexities, or tensions, or employing consistently vivid and persuasive style throughout the passage. The conclusion, if you have time for it, is one place to drive this point home, but notice that at this point, this paper already would have earned all six points because we have attended to style in the introduction and the body paragraphs. Take a look at your own rubric and essay, and then let's look at the conclusion. In the conclusion, I am restating what I argued, but with more nuance and specificity. I am also elaborating on the meaning of being an American using some elegant word choice, and here's a new vocabulary word to walk away with, perspicacity. That's the noun. The adjective is perspicacious, which is like being astute or discerning. Here's the dictionary.com definition. Perspicacity is the quality of having insight or shrewdness, which brings us to shrewd, another great synonym for astute. Words are fun. 
After watching this, you should take some time to prepare for the next essay by reading over your own essay carefully and reviewing the rubric. Schedule a writing conference with me this week or next week if you still have questions. Thanks for watching!